Hi there. Uh, welcome to the Beauty Doctrine live podcast where beauty meets health. This is the absolute first episode of this podcast. So it's going to be scheduled every Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern. Since this is my very first solo episode, I just wanted to take the time to introduce myself. My name is Nadia. I've been a skincare expert for 27 years now. I started my career in the beauty industry as a makeup artist, and then I moved on to be a skincare certified. And then I worked for a bunch of different brands. I held a lot of roles from head of global education, vice president of sales, and so on and so forth. So I left all the corporate world in the start of the pandemic because I had enough promises, you know, for skincare that's going to deliver magical things. Um, and then, of course, there is this thing that we're going through right now in the beauty industry with clean beauty. There are two very polar opposite sides. So you have all these emerging brands that really believe in a cleaner, safer, better product. They quite haven't really figured it out yet, I feel. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done there, but the intention is there. There's great intention there. And then you have the heritage, the basic, you know, older brands that a lot of people are familiar with. And then you have the medical grade and all these different types of classifications in, in mainstream beauty that very resistant to clean because obviously they're losing market share and they're losing sales to these new clean beauty brands. And so the reason I left the corporate world and founded the Beauty Doctrine. So that's the beautydoctrine.com so that I can provide that education to consumers on ingredients and routines. So let's just start by defining what clean beauty is because every brand redefines clean beauty around their specific uh, products and their specific philosophy uh, towards skincare. So I'm going to share with the common denominator between all of the different skincare brands that claim to be clean and make natural uh, and clean skincare. And then what my definition is personally. So clean beauty is the movement that focuses on using, you know, three kind of categories. So you have the natural, you have non-toxic and then environmentally friendly. And so these are all very, very nuanced. So starting off with natural, and I get this a lot. Uh, I have a lot of followers and, and clients that, you know, sometimes I'll recommend a product and they'll say, is it a hundred percent natural? Well, I don't necessarily feel that 100% natural is really enough. It's not about just natural. Uh, natural is very nuanced. So we can think of ingredients like mercury, that's natural, lead, that's natural. They're not healthy for you. And in the skincare sphere, natural is a good start because a lot of times natural ingredients, they're more compatible with our skin. Our body recognizes them. They work well for us. And you have all these cultures that have used incredible natural remedies. You know, like you have uh, the science of Ayurveda, you have Chinese wisdom that has over the centuries developed some incredible natural formulations. You have Moroccan skincare culture, which is pretty much 100% that natural, but it's safe. And that's what I really want to highlight during what I do here at the Beauty Doctrine is to figure out what it is that is safe natural versus just natural. And that's what you really need to try and, and figure out and uh, kind of distinguish. I find many emerging brands use on lemon or lime. That is a huge no-no because lemon, lime, in citrus in general, including essential oils. I'll, I'll get to that, you know, speak about essential oils in more detail, but that is not something that is healthy for the skin in any way. So the, the cons here outweigh the pros big, big time. First thing is the, the acidity. So, you know, we think of lemons, for example, as very healthy to use internally within the, you know, the body, but we have a digestive system. We don't have a digestive system on the face that's going to, you know, process that, that acidity. So all it's going to do is really harm the fragile lipid barrier that protects our skin. So again, anything with lemon, you know, very safe, great to consume internally, not good topically. And then of course you have all of the citrus derived essential oils that are very, very harmful in high doses, or if you're 
if they're used for very long term. So it's really important to know, you know, kind of what dose to look for. Kind of an easy way to actually figure that out is if you smell the product, if it smells really citrusy, lemony, that will tell you that the concentration of essential oils in there, citrus essential oils, is typically too, too high, which means it's probably going to cause irritation. But irritation isn't the only issue. Another issue is photosensitivity. And that means when the skin reacts in and becomes sensitized when exposed to the sun. So let's say you you apply a moisturizer that's based on some citrus ingredient or has a, a, quite a bit of essential a citrus essential oil and you go out in the sun you are highly likely to experience photosensitivity. And a lot of times it actually shows up as pigmentation. So that very product that you probably are trying to use to lighten the pigmentation and get rid of it because citrus in general, it's marketed towards pigmentation and brightening. That very, very product is going to be the one, it, you know, that's responsible for causing pigmentation. So really pay attention to that. And again, look beyond natural. Now let's get to the second element of clean beauty. It's non-toxic. That's really where a lot of the focus is, is in the industry, in the clean beauty sphere is non-toxic. And this comes from a place where, you know, in Europe, there are about 1300 chemicals that are either banned or regulated. So they're, you know, restricted. So you can only use them under certain, um, you know, conditions or, at, you know, certain doses. And so that actually is a huge uh, part of the clean beauty, of how brands define themselves as clean is being devoid of those non toxic ingredients and non-toxic ingredients in general are broken into three categories. So one is um, hormonal disruptors, second is carcinogens, and then the third are irritants. So either irritating to the skin or irritating to the environment. But what the issue is here and what I find uh, having been in the industry for so long and like working with a lot of clean brands is that there is so much focus on what's left out of the you know, formula instead of what's in the formula. And that's one of my biggest goals is to equally focus on both. We need to look at formulations that are you know, free from all of those toxins and parabens, talates, all these things that are harmful and potentially either hormonal disruptors or carcinogens. But again, that's not enough. We want, ultimately, we're looking for true things in skincare, right? Most of us. So we want products that are effective, that are going to work, but also they need to work for the long term without having a lot of side effects in the long term. Sometimes the short term, a lot of us get stuck on that. You know, you want brightening, you want, you know, that instant gratification, but very, very often those uh, products or ingredients that deliver that really fast result are the ones that are going to make your skin more sensitized in the long term. So it's about finding the balance. So we talked about the natural aspect of clean beauty, the non-toxic aspect of clean beauty. And then the third aspect is the environmentally friendly ingredients or caring about sustainability. So that's an amazing part of, of clean beauty. And so, you know, clean brands do not use the little beads that you'll find typically in like a scrub uh, because those are harmful for the environment, for the fish in the sea and the rivers. And they tend to pay more attention than conventional brands to uh, packaging, to like not being wasteful, to recycling, to all these types of like, you know, ethical practices. So that's a, a big plus, you know, in the clean beauty realm, most conventional brands don't pay attention to. So really safety and efficacy, they, they're big goals for many of those uh, skincare brands. Again, not all of them has perfected, you know, the art of making skincare in a way that is truly, truly safe. And that's where you know, I come in, that's where my passion is, is really to kind of get through that clutter and be the consumer's guide to, um, you know, safer, better, healthier product that they can use for the long term. So if you are curious about, you know, what products to that, you know, you could use for your skin, 
that are on the safer side, feel free to check out a bunch of my blogs on thebeautydoctoring.com. So you'll be able to, to learn a ton of information there. And then I curated a selection of products that I tested myself. I vetted every ingredient. And so those are the very best of the best that I was able to find in the beauty industry so far. Now, this first episode, I'm going to try and keep it you know, short and sweet. So I'm just going to go into some general ingredients, right? So help you understand skincare uh, to look for and what like those, those general categories are. So the first category is surfactants. So I start with that because that's pretty much the first thing that touches our skin. Um, surfactants are those things that are going to make your cleanser foam. So I hear this a lot, you know, a lot of people, you know, over the years, I, you know, I've come across many of my clients that actually age their skin very, very fast in an effort to keep it clean. And so you want to be very careful with that. Your skin doesn't need to be squeaky clean. We have this, you know, invisible layer of fat, you know, fat actually is what's going to help maintain the moisture, the integrity of the lipid barrier, um, and it's going to keep you youthful. So you want to keep that intact. You want to keep your natural oils, believe it or not, we have a microbiome on the surface of the skin. So the less you irritate it, the better. And surfactants are actually going to be very drying. They basically eliminate all of the oil that we have on the surface of the skin in an effort to remove dirt, but you're actually also removing all of the moisture from the skin. So you're starting in the negative. You want to, you know, maintain as much moisture as possible in, you know, and kind of add to it, you know, optimize rather than take away from your skin. Most famous surfactant here that many conventional brands use is sodium laurel sulfate. Again, that is the ingredient that's going to, that's responsible for the foaming action that you'll see in shampoos as well as in cleansers. So the more you avoid that ingredient, the better off your skin is. You know, in the clean beauty, you know, realm, a lot of brands have come up with a lot of uh, alternatives that are a little bit more gentle, uh, that use natural sources like um, coconut, for example, to create surfactants. But in all honesty, my personal preference is to not use a foam at all. We do not need foam to remove dirt, impurities, makeup, and all of that. In fact, oil is so much more effective than foam in removing um, makeup. So there are a lot of oil-based cleansers available right now on the market that do a beautiful, beautiful job. The second choice for a cleanser is one that has, um, that's a cream-based or lotion-based. So I'm a huge fan of, or a huge believer of double cleansing in the evening with something that's completely surfactant-free. So the first cleanse is done with an oil, which breaks down oils of very good at breaking everything down, all of the stuff that we accumulate on our skin, you know, throughout the day. Uh, and of course, all of your makeup, waterproof, non-waterproof, all of it, the oil will take care of that. And then the second cleanse cleanses the skin itself and then removes any residue that that oil leaves behind. So that's really the absolute best way to uh, cleanse your skin in the evening. This will allow your pores to shrink back up because the more deposits in the skin, the more dirt, the larger that pore gets. And of course you have that susceptibility to getting breakouts and all kinds of issues. So double cleansing is really have the battle when it comes to your skincare routine. Now, the second category of skincare ingredients that I want to talk about real quick here is humectants. Humectants are very important. So those are ingredients that are attracting moisture or hydration to the skin. They attract water. And so some, you know, popular humectants, the most popular one that gets all the hype is hyaluronic acid, followed by glycerin. And then urea is a humectant that's used in conventional skincare, but not so much, you know, in, in clean beauty because it has a lot of environmental concerns. So we'll stick with hyaluronic acid and glycerin. So hyaluronic acid comes in various weights. So you have lightweight, medium weight, heavy weight. And so that really just references the size of the molecule. Um, so you want as light a texture as possible. So hyaluronic acid is great in like lotions uh, and by lotions, I mean like mists, uh, you know, and toners in, in serums, lightweight serums. So you want it to be like, you don't want that tacky, thick, you know, hyaluronic acid, 
you also always, always, always want to pair it with a some type of mist water hydrator, because um, if you don't do that, hyaluronic acid might dry you out. So the only instances where I saw clients react to hyaluronic acid is when they're using it incorrectly. So the correct way is to always pair it with water. So you apply, you saturate the skin first with a mist, and then you apply your hyaluronic acid product or vice versa. It doesn't matter as long as it's paired with a mist with, with hydration, what you're doing is you're feeding it. You're allowing that hyaluronic acid to draw that water deeper into the skin. And now what it's going to do is plump it from the inside out because think of it as like a sponge, like a dry sponge. It fills with water and it expands. So you see a huge difference in your skin within just 30 minutes if you want to maintain that plumpness. And although that plumpness temporary, so hyaluronic acid doesn't have long-term effects, all of its effects are temporary. However, you're going to train the skin to stay nice and plump. So if you're using hyaluronic acid, which I do, I love hyaluronic acid. A, I always look for it in my skincare. And so I use it day, you know, in my day routine, in my night routine. So imagine that, and it lasts within your skin pretty much all day. You can reactivate it. You can spray a mist to keep giving it that hydration so it can maintain the hydration within the skin. So if you do that every day, you're not allowing for that skin to sink in. You're not allowing dehydration to happen. And so that's really the best way to maintain that water within the skin. So look for hyaluronic acid in your skincare routine. Uh, the other fantastic humectant is glycerin. I feel like it doesn't get enough attention, but it is also wonderful. Um, I tend to look for that as well. The best of both worlds is really to find a product that has both of them, hyaluronic acid and, gl and glycerin. And so those two, you know, uh, generally speaking, they're considered non-irritating. It, I, like I said, I've been in the beauty industry now for 27 years. It's extremely rare to see people kind of come back with feedback that either ingredient um, irritated them. So the next category is occlusives. And so pretty much everybody needs to be using occlusives, except for maybe skin that's like super, super oily. Uh, but most of us, especially now this time of year, fall, winter, um, you want to use some type of occlusive. So I'll just kind of help you understand the good ones from the bad ones. Uh, occlusives are ingredients that help seal moisture and protect the skin. And so they work by forming a barrier on the skin that prevents evaporating. So remember, we talked about hyaluronic acid, we talked about glycerin, you know, about hydration, you know, the skin needs both hydration and moisture. And for example, or hyaluronic acid, which, which we talked about their humectants, they attract that water in the skin. But then if you don't seal it, you want to seal the deal. If you don't seal the, the, the surface of the skin with some type of occlusive, that water starts evaporating. In. And we naturally lose water at, as it is. So it's really important to uh, invest in a good occlusive to maintain the hydration and the moisture of the skin. So that works on uh, or in both uh, arenas there. What are some popular occlusives? The biggest ones that you'll see everywhere, especially in mainstream skincare, are going to be petrolatum, my very least favorite. I know everybody talks about it, including many dermatologists endorse those really big, you know, uh, brands out there that use petrolatum, that use paraffin, mineral oils. Unfortunately, that is a byproduct of the gasoline and oil industry. There is There are zero benefits to it. It's really just that tacky element or ingredient that's going to work as an occlusive, but that has a lot of other side effects. So um, highly comedogenic. So a lot of people actually tend to break out with petrolatum. It has, like I said, zero benefits. You want ingredients on your skin that are going to nourish your skin and moisturize it and deliver benefits versus just sit there. I feel like occupying space. So petrolatum, let's skip that. We don't, we don't like it. Um, you have lanolin and beeswax. Those are other occlusives that are commonly used in, in the skincare industry. Uh, and I speak like mainstream. Now talking about like cleaner beauty, more natural beauty, things that I absolutely love and adore. I like just oils, you know, a lot of oils, if you're just applying them in a good enough concentration. So we're not doing like a couple dots. We're not be being stingy with them. If you use a good amount, an oil can act as an occlusive. 
I love oils. I use a lot of oils on my skin. Uh, I feel like that makes a huge, huge difference for me. If I, whether I have an oil or not, like my skin looks completely different. So I just, I love anything with jojoba. Our shea butters also, a lot of butters. I forgot about this. So butters, are, uh, they can act as occlusives as well. All of those are really, um, you know, safe. There are hardly any complaints about them. Um, unless again, if you're super oily, um, or of course, if you have a, a specific sensitivity or allergy to an ingredient, that's a whole different story. But a lot of these occlusives that I'm talking about are, you know, very, very safe and commonly used in the clean beauty sphere. Now let's get to some of the bad guys. I very least, and, and they're commonly used, you know, very, very commonly used in, in skincare, um, especially natural skincare. So I know a lot of people that follow me and a lot of people that are interested in clean beauty probably use these ingredients, uh, but that's kind of where I draw the line with a lot of clean brands is at essential oils. So they're heavily used in the clean beauty space. That's, that's something that I really hope that, you know, changes very soon. And I, I understand the mindset behind it. A lot of brands are trying to provide consumers with products that are fragrance free because fragrance we've established already. Fragrance is one of the worst things that you can apply on your skin, inhale, and I'm talking conventional fragrance. Unfortunately, many skincare products are, are packed with fragrances and fragrances have been proven to have fertility issues to cause many, many hormonal, you know, problems. So we want to avoid fragrances as much as possible. Now, the alternative that a lot of natural brands found, because they still want to deliver that, that beautiful sensorial experience, they're like, okay, well, we'll take out the fragrance and then let's put essential oils instead. And that's a big mistake. Essential oils tend to have certain therapeutic benefits, obviously. So if you guys, if you think about let's say lavender. So you think automatically it, that it's going to be soothing. Well, yes, it is soothing, but not if applied to the skin. It is soothing as an aromatherapy. Really important to make that distinction between the, the therapeutic benefits of inhaled essential oils versus applied to the skin. So first rule of thumb with essential oils is to make sure that it's diluted. So even like when you look at your skincare you know, or skincare ingredient list, I should say, um, you don't want to uh, essential oils are high up on the list you want them at the very, very, very you know bottom so and another way to gauge if there are a high concentration of essential oils in your product is to pretty much just smell it so if you smell it it smells really fragrant that means it has a high amount of essential oils in there it probably is not a good option for you even if it's 100% natural even if it's clean even if you love the packaging all of that try to shy away from those products that are highly fragrant even with essential oils because that you know use of day in and day out can cause that irritation it can break up you know they're quite volatile so it can that can break up a lipid barrier of the skin which is really important we want to maintain the lipid barrier because that's what really protects the skin that that's what keeps it youthful and it keeps out the pathogens, all the bad stuff that's trying to get into our skin, you know, it keeps it out. So really important to maintain that lipid barrier and not use too many products with alcohols, harsh preservatives. Of course, we need preservatives to a certain extent. We'll get to that in another episode. But, um, you know, just kind of in general, those are ingredients that you want to avoid. And of course, essential oils are at the very top of the list of aggressors um, on the skin. So again, if lavender sounds amazing, it's not so amazing if it's in your skincare product. And believe it or not, chamomile as well, that can be sensitizing if it's high up in concentration in your skincare product. Uh, the worst offenders in my book are citrus oils. So anything that sounds like, you know, citrusy, basically lime, lemon, bergamot, neroli, all of those, the list is very long. Um, so try to avoid those and if, if, if they're high on the ingredient list. I allow myself a certain amount of essential oils. There's a product that I adore, that I love, and, and I feel I like all the other ingredients in it. Let's say it has a lot of peptides, a lot of amazing ingredients. And then that's the only product product I use with essential oils, well, let's say it's a mask, something that I use maybe once a week or every other week, I would allow myself to use that. But if it's in my daily moisturizer, 
I probably, I would skip that moisturizer. My daily moisturizer would not have essential oils. It's something that I allow myself to use, but within limits. Now, there are ingredients that are not essential oils that can actually enhance the scent of, of a given product. And those are plant extracts. So those are quite different uh, from essential oils. So essential oils are extracted via steam and distillation versus plant extracts, which are more extracted from the plant uh, via solvents. So a solvent is either like alcohol or water. Those are a little bit less irritating than essential oils. And um, they tend to carry, you know, the same therapeutic or even better therapeutic benefits to the skin. And so those I love, I obviously look for products that have, you know, various plant extracts. So um, a good example would be caffeine extract. Caffeine is incredible for, you know, uh, circulation, for blood circulation. It's good for cellulite. It's good for dark circles. You know, we have green tea extracts. There are plenty of different extracts that are in, um, in skincare. So those are uh, great. Now uh, we talked about essential oils. Let's talk about plant oils. Uh, a lot of people confuse those two. So essential oils, again, they're volatile, they're fragrant, and they're uh, extracted from the plant via the steam distillation. When it comes to plant oils, they're typically pressed. So think of olive oil, think of jojoba, avocado, coconut oil, all of those, they, they're uh, also referred to as carrier oils. And so those are the ones that you would use to dilute an essential oil, for example. So let's say you want to use tea tree. So tea tree is really famous for being, you know, antibacterial, antimicrobial. It helps with fungal infections. It helps with acne. So that's great, but it needs to be diluted in a good amount of plant oil. So that's the difference there. So I hope that that explained the difference. My very favorite, you know, at the very top of the list, uh, Plant oil is jojoba oil and rosehip oil. So those two I adore. Actually combined them in this product called Barrier Repair Serum, which I have on my website. So first ingredient is going to be rosehip oil and rosehip is incredible incredible because it's rich in vitamin E, it's rich in vitamin C naturally and vitamin A, which a lot of people are interested in because that is natural retinol. It in fact has transretinoic acid, which converts into retinol within the skin. And yes, for those that will come back saying, oh, it's really low concentrations. And that is fine. Actually, I intentionally look for ingredients that have low concentration in actives uh, because remember we're using these ingredients every single day and every single night. And so that is plenty. So it's always nice to go with low concentrations. You don't want to get stuck into that mindset of marketing, you know, high concentration, powerful, you know, penetrates deep, all of that. That's just to sell the product. You want things that are more gentle. They still have all the ingredients that you want, but you use them day in and day out. You stick with them. And now your skin can tolerate them for the long term without all the sensitivity and irritation. So rosehip is one of my very, very favorite uh, plant oils, although it's a little bit fragile. So really important. I wish I had a, a bottle here, but very important to buy a uh, plant oils in general, but especially rosehip, darker bottles, because that helps protect them from oxidation. So when oils come in contact with light, they oxidize. And so that means is they're becoming rancid. So they end up not working for your skin. So instead of working for your skin, they work against your skin. And so that's one thing that I would totally pay attention to as you're shopping for your oils. And with oils such as rosehip oil, buy them in smaller containers versus those, those very big ones that you find on Amazon. They're not going to last at some point. And when I say they're not going to last, it's not the actual oil. It's the efficacy of the oil. You want it to always be fresh. Get your oils in smaller containers. Don't buy a ton of different oils. Get one, finish it, and then move on to the next one. So you're always using a fresh batch that's not oxidized. And it's very hard to tell when an oil is oxidized. Like I said, to, you know, my other top oil is jojoba. Jojoba is the closest oil to our natural, you know, lipid barrier. So that does really, really well with human skin. So if you're ever at a loss, you know, not too sure if let's say argan oil or olive oil or coconut is suitable for your skin type, 
you cannot go wrong with uh, jojoba. So that's pretty much it for the ingredients that I'm going to be, or that I've covered so far in this episode. Um, again, this is the very, very first live podcast. I have it live here on TikTok. I also have it live on YouTube and it's being recorded. So it's going to go on YouTube. If you're watching this episode, recording, so make sure you're subscribing, send me your questions. The upcoming episodes, we're going to have a lot of different guests. So again, the beauty doctrine is all about health. So it's not just skincare, it's healthy skincare and a healthier lifestyle that's going to help you attain that amazing skin. So I really hope that this episode was informative. Thank you so much for watching. Be well, be safe, be beautiful. Take care.